Lord Lanning, welcome to the Game Informer Show, sir. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great yeah. to be here, Ben. No, it's a real honor to have you, man. I've wanted to talk to you forever. I've been at Game Informer for like five years, and uh, the first Odd World was very important to me. So thank you for your work on that, man. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. Hey, thank you. The team did a good job, so you know I'm always proud of that. Yeah. So you just want to. Set the lay of the land. What do you, what's going on with you these days? What's happening over there? <laughs> well, as you can tell by my hair, man, I'm just getting older at an accelerated <laughs> rate, it appears. So uh, trying to trying to manage that is is new, but uh, <laughs> hopefully hopefully we're successful in the process. And then uh, beyond that, you know, of course, we're working on the next uh, we're working on the next title. Yeah, which is the remake of it's, it's called Odd World Stories. Well, sort of. So uh, if we were to put this in comparison to New and Tasty. Um, new and tasty, we looked at the following way, which was we said, you know what? We, the script of new and tasty was sort of like that, almost like that mature nursery rhyme that right. we wanted it to be. It was told in rhyme. It was the different things. But it, but it really sort of as an arc, we went, you know what? For that classic, uh, and time has treated it well. Uh, let's let's keep the script. And when we were thinking about it, like, what happens in Hollywood when they remake a movie? Why the remakes we almost never like as much as the original? And one of my favorite films of all time was uh, Time Machine. You know, the uh, the original film. Okay. Which was, uh, you know, I used to have a poster right from me, but I think it was like 1950s or so, okay. 60s or something, and uh, 60 ish. Forgive me, I'm wrong, so forgive me. For <laughs> Don't worry about specific, it. I've never but... even seen it, so you can do no wrong. Oh, man. I know. I, I read the book. I enjoyed the book when I read it as a kid, but I never okay, seen the movie. Let me, ask you, let me ask you. You've seen Star Wars, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. You've seen Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah. Okay, man. You haven't seen Time Machine? Like, what do you you put it up there with those two? <laughs> yeah, man. This is serious <laughs> You got to check it out. It's <laughs> well, right? So, uh, anyway, it's one of my favorite his movies of all time. And... And then uh, I think it was Tim Burton re remade it later, and it was just you know it wasn't it wasn't all in the same capacity. Right? Sure. And uh, and we see that occasionally with films. And we were like, hey, why didn't they just remake Time Machine with the same script? The script was great. Why didn't they just remake it with 21st century technology? That would be mind blowing, right? Forbidden Planet, same thing. Just keep the same script, you know. Yeah. Uh, the day the Earth is still. Just keep the same script, and it, it could be great. So, um, although they did do a pretty good job on the day of the Earth, it's still that was okay. Yeah, Keanu. Oh, they had Keanu, which is like okay. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, what's his name in the Matrix? Neo. You know, so Neo saves the day in, in, uh, as the alien. But uh, to the point, and to your question was on Apes Od remaking Apes Odyssey. We said, look, uh, we have a we have. It's not just an HD. We're going to totally redo it with 21st century technology, but we want to keep the script the same, and we want to learn from 20 years of game design since. So how do we improve it but keep the heart right. and keep the script the same? That was our mandate internally for New and Tasty. And for Exodus, uh, Exodus had a different beginning. And long story short, Exodus happened um, in a in, – in, in a, basically a, a situation where we had delivered a hit for the publisher and our plan was to sort of take you know probably another two years and i'm not saying it was a smart plan but it was probably taking another two years on the next title what happened was we were one of the few titles that delivered for them that christmas and this was a gt interactive and it was a new big you know hope a new big hope of game publishers okay and uh, so they were going after things really aggressively but what happened is a few of the other titles slipped at Christmas and completely hammered this company's public stock value. But we made it on time and we gave them a hit. So, of course, that put us in a bad spot because now they're saying, we need your next game for next Christmas. And you're, you're the guys that came through for us, so you have to do it. And uh, at the time, you know, they owned about half the company. So just being good partners, you, you know, this is life and business, right? So you got to sure. play. But what that meant was we had to get done a title. Uh, in nine months, and the previous one took us uh, over two and a half years. So that was that was a big challenge. And what that meant was uh, we, ha we had to scream through the script. And uh, at the end of the story, it, it, so instead of being like, are we happy with this script and are we going to move forward in development? It was more like you got a week and a half to get the script signed off because we have to move into development, which is a problem I call sequelitis. Sure. Right? Meaning um, why is it that the things that we – see in movies and stuff. The sequels is rarely as good as the original, but, you know, sales might be twice, something like that. Um, 
but rarely does it have the same heart. And the reason is usually time pressure to get to market and then the business changes. You know, the Matrix 2 was not the Matrix 1. And the Matrix 1 was better, but it only had about a tenth of the budget. I'm, I'm exaggerating there, but it was much smaller budget. Right. right? And so in our case, we built Exodus and the uh, team did a great job. We did it. It was, it was a Herculean task that was done in nine months. But what it meant was uh, it, this, the script was not necessarily sort of the heart of what we wanted to communicate. And time and circumstances, you know, got us there. So now when we look back and we had pulled the audience before we started – when we announced that we were making new and tasty, we said, what do you want us to make next? And this is our core fan base who we listen to. Mm -hmm. And uh, no matter how brutal it can be sometimes, you know, you're like, oh, my God. You know, okay, they're really upset. But we listened. And what they uh, said was, we want to see Exodus done. If you do a good job on new and tasty, we want to see Exodus done that way too. Is this just like tweets like responding to the Twitter post? Yeah, you have yeah, like a poll on the site or what, what exactly poll, is it? Poll Facebook, poll our website forums. Okay. And, uh, and that's what we would do. We would poll the forums. So Facebook and, and like that. And uh, people get, you know, so you set up a poll and people like polls. I yeah. like polls. But anyhow, um, then we get, you know, we get thousands of responses and we have a better idea of where the herd is. And, uh, and we said, look, you know, new, new, new titles from Oddworld are kind of more expensive than we can afford yet. And we like the independence that we have now. So if you'll support us on, on the budget, uh, you know, meaning we're budget, then, uh, <laughs> then, um, you know, what game would you like to see? And, and so new games, people are like, we want to see Fangus or we want to see Stranger 2 or we want to see a brand new game. And we'd be like, well, that's really nice and they're more expensive than we can afford. But what if we could, like, here's, here's a slew of titles. And even with some of those new titles, people were like, do it to Exodus. Like, do a great job on Exodus. And a lot of people loved Exodus. Yeah. So we went, okay, but now let us assess that internally. And internally we said, we want to make the script of it. We, we, the, the story that inspired the sort of mythos, the high concept of what inspired Exodus, we really liked. And what was but, that? Uh, that is, is that uh, it involved Soulstorm Brew, the brewery. It involved a brewmaster who was the new, like, glucken, you know, antagonist and the whole thing. And it was really a fable where part two of, in part one, the, the, the the slaves wake up and realize they're slaves to a big industrial mechanism, to a company. They're not, they're not what they thought they were. So they wake up to the idea they're actually slaves. And they wake up to the idea that they're doomed. And what happens is they free themselves of this and Abe's the catalyst. They free themselves of this oppression. And Abe's ex exodus was about, and now the slaves start to realize, this was at the heart of it, the slaves start to realize that they are slaves to their own addictions and habits, and they're played that way as well. So they don't need to be directly employed, but they can be directly manipulated through consumer products, through addictions, through things like that. Light that's theme. The, really, really lighthearted for the kids out there. Yeah, you know, we figure, like, that's some really good childhood topics. <laughs> A light fare for the family. So um, that was at the core of it. And, and uh, you know, I mean, Oddworld has never been something where you walk away and a marketing department goes, if someone would just build a game about genocidal, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> soil and green type you know, content, we think it'd be a big hit today. I mean, it is not where we get our ideas from, right? It's not the marketing department. Like, we think we could sell this. We're like, nah, this is crazy. <laughs> but what we do believe is this resonates more relevantly to the audience. And this is not things they're getting in a lot of what they're eating. Yeah, so the, media diet. So the idea is it's kind of a reboot of the Exodus concept. Is that how yeah. you describe so, Soulstorm, so, the new one? So, so uh, I have rewritten Exodus, and it's no longer Exodus, but it's inspired by the Exodus story. And then what we're using is we're using that as the spine, and we're using the gameplay flow as the spine to inspire this title. And the title is still about a brewery. It's still about brew. And it's still about Abe having just freed the, the, the slaves of Rupture Farms and now having to bring basically an exodus about, which is why it was named Exodus, was really the freeing of the slaves and following their leader, right? So is and, it just the idea that you want to kind of appease both camps and both worlds? Oh, no, no, no. It's less of that. And it's more of what makes a great title. Sure. So, so what we're saying is we're going, okay um, – we, we, we're listening, we hear your feedback, we appreciate what you're saying, but if we're going to go remake Exodus, which was a, a big story and a big game, uh, we're going to make it 
what it was originally intended to be, not what we got done in nine months. And it starts with the script. That's really interesting. So, and so uh, at a very practical level, which I think you'd appreciate, you know, a game informer is, likes to get into the development of things, right? Yeah. Like, why did you make these decisions? Um, at a very practical level, a lot of time is spent on developing each of the puzzles, on spent on, spent on layout, spent on developing mechanics, you know, these types of things. And so by being inspired by the original story of Exodus, but it's a complete retake. Uh, however, a lot of the puzzles, a lot of the layouts, you'll, you'll notice, you'll be like, oh, this is where the original is kind of, you know. <laughs> so there will be this, this fact of like I'm watching something completely new. But it's clearly inspired by this original. But the level of fidelity that was in New and Tasty, is that what you guys are shooting for? Uh, it would be better. Better? Significantly. Yeah. But it is a, a different development studio, right? Because you were working with just Ed yeah, Lauder yeah, for I, so I, long. Me, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, however, it, yes, that, that is true. But um, what that also means is that the new development studio, we have more resources. It's closer to home. Uh, we're going to be, we're actively involved full time on this production. I, I, me personally and Benny, Terry and uh, other people, uh, Michael Bross, who was the original composer on Munch and Stranger, uh, Raymond Swanlin, who's the original designers of, uh, uh, from Abe's Exodus. He was a background artist to, uh, Stranger's Wrath. He was the key artist designing Stranger and other characters. And he went on to since become like, you know, really world famous illustrator, his recent properties about being Star Wars and, uh, 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 Warhammer and Magic the Gathering cards, like Not Raymond Swanlin, you know, pretty, pretty great talent. Yeah. So we're bringing back, uh, you know, some real uh, seasoned odd world talent that made a big difference in our past. And this is, we are co-developing this. So we, we are actively in the trench, myself personally, full time from beginning to end. New and Tasty didn't really go that way. New and Tasty was kind of on autopilot at JAW. And then I came in in the last uh, nine months and, 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 we, and we wrapped it up. Just because that was a more faithful remake? <clears throat> it was a more faithful remake and we didn't realize how much exposure New and Tasty was actually going to get. That, and that's the truth. So we had one budget on it originally, and we thought it was going to cost this much. It wound up costing us that much, right? And we, yeah. it, literally, like, that's pretty accurate. And uh, at least four times more than we expected, and we're self-financed, so it was very difficult. Um, but we got something done uh, basically with our focus over the last nine months on a three-year development. And in this one, we'll be involved with the development the entire time, and we're shooting for, you know, inside of a two-year release. Nice. And... Uh, inside of and but we're not given a firm date yet because that would be dumb right and and uh how it, and now we hit the grand ground running with the engine that exists for new and tasty which was a ton of work to get unity to deliver unity and tasty and i don't mean that as unity a corporation i just mean the uh unity as a, a company was actually surprisingly responsive and supportive to requests that we had in their core animation system, core lighting, core shaders. There's a lot of different requests. We go, look, guys, with the way this is being done, you can't get this type of an effect. With the way that's being done, you can't get this type of uh, animation, you know, fidelity. And, uh, and I really give to their credit a few years ago. You know, it's totally different management now. I don't know how it'll go. But uh, a few years ago when uh, Dave... Uh, uh, I always say his name wrong. I'm not very good at the Scandinavian pronunciations, but I want to say Hag Hag Hevel's son. Well, yeah, how do you say his name? You know, CEO, the original founder of Unity. But anyway, nothing but kudos to him. Yeah. That entity, because they they recognized that requests that we're making made Unity look better, and they implemented them, which is really rare for a successful software company to do. So you're pretty happy with the engine overall. I know, like, I think... For, um, for this this type of game. I mean, we, right. you know, we had our headaches going to multi-skews. Um... There's always some sort of compromises when you use middleware instead yeah. of baking. Well, it's interesting. Uh, like, I think like when Firewatch came out recently, uh, there's kind of a wave of realization amongst people to be like, hey, Unity on PS4 and consoles in general, like maybe specifically just for 3D games, because I think I remember New and Tasty running pretty well. They say like, ah, it's not running that great. Do you think Unity is having a tough time on the consoles for some reason? Do you have any insight well, into why uh, that is? Uh, well, what I think is that uh, uh, it all depends on what you're trying to do. Right. If we were making a really simple light, like what was Unity's, uh, you know, basically one button and you get all the SKUs, right? Mm -hmm. 
Maybe that's sort of true if you have a really light mobile game that utilizes the best capability of the lowest end performing device. And then you can go to PS4, Xbox One, Wii U, Vita, uh, mobile, no problem, right? Because you've got a very light, super light game that's not using any of the capabilities of those higher systems. But if you were uh, did it, approach it the way we did, which is let's try and max out Unity's capability on the PS4, and I'm not saying all capabilities, but you know, for the type of game we were making, we didn't do multiplayer, we didn't do other things. But if we try to max out the capabilities on US4, then we're not, let's have a really hard time getting the other every other skew because now you're scaling back. You know, so if you're scaling up, it's easy. If you're scaling down, it's hard. Okay. So, uh, uh, and I that that that's really a developer decision. You know, I can't hold uh, Unity responsible for those calls. Yeah. But that's what we did, and that made it a lot harder. Now, in the case of Fire. Watch. Uh, I was actually uh, uh, I was at an event and sat next to uh, the creator of that. Sean Bannerman. We, we we're talking a lot. Yeah, yeah. Great guy. Yeah, for know. sure. He's and, been on the show. Uh, re really love where they're coming from. Um, and big supporter of what they're doing. Well, at least in spirit. You know, it's like saying I support the troops, but you know, I haven't coughed up a dime for anything. But um, <laughs> but in their case. Uh, what they were trying to do, and what you'll notice is different, what they were trying to do is they were getting like, they, they weren't having level loaded rooms. They were trying to put you on an open world atmosphere that felt more like Unreal 4, right? And in terms of, wow, I, I, I look in the distance, I see woods way off there and I can actually go there and I don't have these big, uh, you know, it's not like I got to go through a tunnel repeatedly to have a caching in and cash out of a level management. So they tried to do something, I think, that was very ambitious for Unity. And in that respect, they succeeded quite well. And uh, uh, so in my personal opinion, and this is just interesting because I think they're interesting and I think their approach is interesting, is that uh, by releasing a title like that, doing it the first time, no matter what they – so they learned a lot. Uh, they did – financially, they did really well. And uh, – and in that, you know, they may make different choices of engines in the future for different reasons, but it's really smart stuff that they're doing. So they, so they pushed Unity in a way where they were trying to push environment and distance in natural environments further than I've ever seen Unity push, they told me, than they've ever seen Unity push. And so I think that accounts for a lot of the performance challenges that people might identify. Gotcha, gotcha. So I'm curious just what life has been like for you. You've been working in the Oddworld universe for 20 years. I mean, have you kind of had like a... A Guns N' Roses arc where you wanted to break away for a long time and now with New yeah, Tasty, it it's called, like you're getting back on the road. It was called 2005 to about uh, uh, 2009 to 10, really. Was that you liberating know? for you to get away for a little while? I mean, were you still yeah, jotting down yeah, ideas? Yeah, because I, I, wanted to, I wanted to try some other things. And we did. We did. And uh, we went and we got a film deal. And uh, so we got a film deal in 2007 that turned into an economic financial crisis in 2008 for the planet. And, and so we, were, we had a film development deal on a new property that was actually green light by a big AAA publisher in the, as, a, as one of the, their big bets uh, for the PS2 generation. Uh, I'm sorry, PS3 generation. And we walked from that at that time because we were just, we were just sick of... Uh, the way the publisher developer relationships were going and we didn't want to lose our IP over time. So we just went, you know, why, why are we doing this? Let's mm -hmm. just wait and let's have the hope that digital distribution, distribution will let us eventually go directly to, to the customer and get away from this retail, dis, dysfunctional retail publisher developer relationships that basically, um, you know, are the legacy of the game business through the 90s and the, the early uh, 2000s and stuff mm -hmm. that basically ate up you know, all the small developers, mid-tier developers either acquisitions or out of business, right? Do you feel like the world's changed enough where you're really happy with well, the situation? Yeah, huge, huge. And, uh, but, but we went on to do a couple different things and then stuff like, just to say, uh, the CG film was rated R CG animated. Was this Citizen Siege? Citizen Siege. Okay, yeah. And, um, and the fact was we figured out that with the financial crisis, no one was going to... At the end of the day, the chances that we'd be able to release a $60 million movie rated R and CG and people that are now fiscally like risk averse, we're going we're gonna to continue to support. So we just went, timing's bad mm -hmm. for trying to push a rated R CG film. And I think we're seeing it coming up with, uh, uh, I just met with these people the other day, Anna Pertin Pictures, with uh, Sausage Party. 
Oh yeah, yeah. Who's working on that again? <laughs> it's Annapurna Pictures. Okay. It's, uh, the the uh, the studio that's behind it, you know. But it's just I mean, sausage party. You're like, what, what are you kidding me? It's gonna be rated R, animated CG. Is so, it like Jonah I mean, Hill and stuff behind that one? Huge. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jonah Hill, yeah. Okay. Uh, and whoever else. And uh, but basically, that crowd is the scriptwriters and the voices. So they had huge, you know, fifty million plus views as a trailer. You know, they're they're on their way to a huge success. But the beauty of that is they they'll prevail, rated R C G, in the way that Deathpool, uh, sorry, Deadpool, Deadpool yeah. just prevailed rated R, you know, comic book movie. So you're saying you're hoping that opens a door for Citizen Siege to come back? Uh it's possible, you, you know, different, I wrote, I wrote Citizen Siege in 2005, 2006 is, is when we, uh, particularly me, me and Raymond Swanlin and stuff, were plotting out Citizen Siege. And, uh, and I'm not exactly sure that that's the story I want to tell in the world today. Hmm. The, world, the world's changed a little bit. Uh, and it's intense, man. It's dark and intense. And Odd World's already dark and intense, but Citizen Siege is just like f***ed up. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I love it, but I'm not exactly sure. And it's a big, big thing. It's a big project. And so it was greenlit as a AAA project, and it was in development as a motion picture. So it's a, pri you know, we still retain all the pub all the rights to it and stuff. Um, but right now, I feel like Odd World's the most relative, relevant to to the times and um and it's also very difficult to launch new ip today so with odd world there's actually people voraciously yelling at us for more content and and we're kind of dumb to leave that sitting on the table when the time is right and the time is right in a lot of a lot of ways it's right uh we became fully independent if you think in 2005 we made a big hard choice which is we shut down the studio we uh laid off you know a lot of people lost their jobs and we went hey man we're, we're just we're not willing to give it all up under these time and circumstances with these types of relationships and and neither should you be you know so um i think we always had good blood no matter what happened in Odd World with the employees, I hear all the time people say, you know, that was still like my best gig in the gaming industry. I'm still the most proud of that work. Like I hear that a lot. But these guys went on, like Ryan Ellis went on. He's head of the art department at uh, Bungie now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, these guys went down to Blizzard. They went to Sony, uh, Sony uh, Santa Monica, you know. They're all over the industry in great places. And uh, so uh, just talent-wise speaking, I guess I'm going to the kudos of the team. Yeah, that was that was team that worked on Exodus, right? Uh, and what's funny is we get there, those guys support, even though they're not doing, you know, that much. And what you'll notice is we'll, like in New and Tasty, we put all the original teams' names in the credits as That's well. Nice. So these are just things p people don't do as practices. And I should say publishers don't do as practices in the industry. But as indie, who gives a shit? <laughs> give people credit if they did something. I mean, I worked on movies that my name is not on, you know, and that's just, that was the way Hollywood works. You're not union. It took forever for effects people to be listed in motion pictures. Uh, you know, the hand model shows up and they, they get into People magazine and the effects people were like, they don't even broadcast their Academy Awards on TV. They do it, you know, it's not even, the audience didn't care to watch, right? Yeah. So, so walking between those two worlds between Hollywood and the gaming industry, what do you think... Uh how are things recently? How are things changed in the last couple of years? Are there any, any trends popping up that really interest you? Yeah, there's a lot. And uh, uh, so just staying away from all the like VR hype and stuff like that for the right. moment. And that, what that's doing is it's actually tying Hollywood and games more together again, except not in the, the uh, cheesy branded low quality game release way. But uh, Hollywood gets that this is a new medium. And so <clears throat> there's... Uh, there's uh, First, let me say, in the landscape of VR, just why not say it, is there's more fraud going on than I've ever seen in the business. I'm not going to name specific things, but there's more bullshit. There's more absolute bullshit being sold to investors across the planet. And what's changed a lot is now you've got investors coming from different territories and they're very culturally different types of investors. So you got a lot of China, you got Russia, you got <clears throat> Brazil, South America, India. These are places where, you know, people are becoming billionaires and they want to get into media exportation businesses and entertainment businesses and things like this, get their money out of countries. There's all kinds of shit going on. And everyone who has basically had a failing operation, whether it was in games or in film or in theme parks, now they're the VR experts in the world and they're going to solve your problems with VR. And it's like, holy shit. 
it's like con men, conning, con men, conning, con men. I've seen a ton of it. I'm not going to mention any specifics, but I haven't seen it like this since, since, uh, the rocket science days. Remember in the beginning when, uh, I don't know if you remember, but before, do you, were you around when the 3DO came out? I mean, I was a kid. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So there was all this hype back then. Oh, Sillywood and Hollywood and uh, Silly was Silicon Valley and Hollywood are going to connect and there's going to be, you know, the World Wide Web is coming and uh, uh, we're going to be streaming movies and all this shit was being talked about in, the, you know, like 92, 93. And that's actually when we got the money because I realized there was a lot of dumb money getting poured into the video game space. <clears throat> and I was like, well, anyone who knows what they're doing shouldn't be investing in us. Right? Really? Because we don't know what we're really doing. So right. we just have a good story and a good hope and a lot of will to make it happen. But if you're looking for, you know, who's done this before and who's made hits and games, you know, we were the wrong people to look at. But because of all that sort of dumb money was floating in, I was like, this is our chance to get in, you know, 92 to 94. So we started putting together business plans to get in and get the money to start Oddworld. And, uh, and so I haven't seen it since that time where a lot of people were just being hoodwinked into solutions that didn't exist. So and, so is this dumb money being thrown around? I mean, does it hurt developers then ultimately? Is it just – or is it only a uh, boon for no, them for no, a little no. while? No, I think it's going to hurt investors. Okay. And uh, uh, I, th I think what will happen is you'll, you'll have – You'll have the typical, you know, de developers or other entities that are impersonating developers. Hmm. Not to be underestimated right now in terms of the quantity of this. There are a lot of people that claim to be developers, entities, and they really don't have any history of developing software. But they might have a history in some other sector and not say, oh, you know, VR and you're in China and you need a VR solution. And, you know, we're in California and blah, blah, blah. blah and it's just both. Yeah, so there's going to be a lot of lawsuits eventually. So they just want to be the middlemen between this possible new trend and, and actual no, developers? No, they just want to survive, man. This is just capitalism, right? Like what happens is you have companies that aren't working out. They've failed in, you know, they failed as a mobile company. They failed this or this. They failed this or that, whatever. They're just struggling. They're constantly there. And now they see all this dumb money flowing into VR, flowing into VR. And so let's become the VR experts, right? Mm -hmm. So you got people showing demos that aren't theirs, right? So what do you think, I mean, five years from now, what do you think the VR industry is going to look like? It's a little hard to predict because VR is going, first of all, VR is not going away, right? It's not going away. It's got Facebook and, money. It's not going away. And Facebook's going to be the slowest player to succeed. Hmm. Right. Facebook, I mean, that was the most overvaluated buy in history. Seriously. Yeah. It's, you know, and, and I mean, I'm not giving, hey, good, more power to everybody, but $2 billion for a demo. There's other things going on. There's other things going on that, that motivated that that aren't just like, oh, this is going to be huge and this is going to be the system to do it. There's another reason I think Facebook to pay $2 billion for it. And, I, and I, it's, it's not one I'll, I'll mention because it's theoretical. You know, it's my – it doesn't make sense. It never made sense unless you're coming at it from a completely different angle. But I can give you my forecast of what I think is going to happen in VR. Hang on, is that more so, of a conspiracy angle you're talking about? Well, Something no, with, as no, far no, as data? No. Just, just, just pure business, but not necessarily business being talked about. Okay. okay. Right? And if you just look at, look, Facebook versus, let's take one possibility. Facebook versus Google. You're hiring people in Silicon Valley. Which company do you want to work for? You're, you're a $200,000 a year programmer. Which company do you want to work for? Probably go Google. Fuck yeah, you're going to go Google, right? <laughs> Because they got a million interesting things and scientists and problems that they're solving across the world. Who knows? They're going to be driving automated cars. They're going to be putting ships in space. They're going to be redefining exploration in every way, shape, and form through maps. I mean, right? Yeah. I know. I know scientists that figure out that other countries have uh, illegal toxicity dumping problems, and they're identifying those problems on Google Earth, Google Earth. Right. So, so Facebook is different. So Facebook's company have figured out how to become an ultimate. Um, connector and uh, promo audience. Uh, but if you were a real cutting edge programmer, do you want to go to Facebook? Right. Well, what's their future? Mm -hmm. but now that they own Facebook, now that they own Oculus, maybe you want to go to Facebook. So it's a, it's a recruiting tool to look cool. Is that the basic idea? I've heard some people say that. I think there's some validity to it. Paying $2 billion for it is a, another, another, like there's obviously something more going on. <laughs> and I don't think Zuckerberg's a naive guy, right? So right. something's more going on because it doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. uh, however, what it did was it made everyone else say, this is real if Facebook's paying $2 billion. That was the main catalyst, right? That's the thing that got everyone to go, oh, Zuckerberg's a genius. You know, he's the new Bill Gates. He's the new Steve Jobs. 
must be something there. Let's rush in. And the fact is, is that if you get a good demonstration of VR today, whether it's a Valve demonstration, whether it's an Oculus demonstration, even if, if it's a Sony demonstration, you're sold. Mm -hmm. You're sold. You see a good one, you're sold. And so it's going to, so that effect is very powerful. The VR effect, you know, when you can stand on a ledge of a building and you can't step forward and you know that you're on a safe floor in front of you and your primal fears are that deep where, where all of a sudden crossing a little narrow ridge is no longer just a jump in a platform or game, but you're in your pants. And I, and you know, with the mild fear of heights, I mean, I got a little Native American blood and we're supposed to be the best at the heights. Apparently I didn't get that gene because it's like, man, high heights, it a little freaked me out. Well, I mean, I'll tell you, nothing does it like VR and freak you out. I mean, you talk about, uh, you know, being scared of heights, and that's interesting. Also, like you think of like Zemeckis with The Walk, isn't that the name of the movie? Where yeah, that was yeah, a big yeah. push well, for them, they had the VR example, experience. Right. Yeah. Did you see the video that the company cut together a trailer where they showed live action people, you know, real people doing it in an empty room, and then they're compositing it over the walk? Oh, no, I didn't see Tom that. Ham, Tom Ham, if you search his name, you'll find the name of the company, and on their site, you'll find the name of the. He's a journalist, he used to be with TV Guide and stuff like that. Uh, <clears throat> really great guy, but he, he, they, his, and the entity he's a part of put together a videotape that I think is the best thing going to sell VR to people who haven't experienced VR. It's just an amazing watching how they did the walk and, uh, it's really excellent. You can see it. It's on their site, but, um, yeah. So, you know, do I think Zemeckis is going to be the guy who's building the best VR? Absolutely not. <laughs> right. You know, just like I don't expect Zemeckis or Spielberg or Lucas or any other guys to build any hit games. Right. However, when it starts crossing a line of how can a little VR experience help sell a movie, I think they're going to do a damn good job creating basically VR experiences that are commercials. Yeah, right. it makes for a good headline at least. Like, hey, check out this crazy thing in VR. Yeah, and what's Hollywood's problem? You know, they can't get people in the theater. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, not can't. We have record-breaking numbers, but it's always a challenge. It's always more and more expensive, and ticket prices are not getting cheaper, and theaters are having to offer more nicer seats, drinks, you know, dining while you're at the movie. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you go to the, the nice ones in L.A. It's like, wow, man, this feels like, you know, what kings and queens must have when they went to the opera. And now you, know, you hear I mean, all of Really going off. Yeah, you hear so much about like the divide in Hollywood too with what's it called the screening room uh, the theoretical tech where it's just you can get new movies for a certain subscription price and it seems like directors are, directors are split down the middle between absolutely hating this idea of stabbing yeah. theaters in the back versus being all for it so well you know the thing about film directors that I've learned is very few of them are actually good business people hmm right and uh, it's like rock and roll stars very few of them are actually good business people. You know, uh, the, the, C, the, the chairman of Oddworld today, Sharon McKenna, who was my, my partner, who I was lucky enough to get her to be my boss. And that's the fact. Like, this was a legendary producer in Hollywood computer graphics and visual effects. But she used to do things with all kinds of talent. You know, Michael Jackson, Mick Jagger, like that, shooting music videos. I mean, she's worked with them all, right? And, uh, and for an example, Mick Jagger... Is a brilliant business guy. Okay. So, so Mick Jagger's degree is in economics. And I think it's from London School of Economics or something like that. If it's not as Oxford or some yeah, Oxford or something, it's ridiculously brainiac, you know, <laughs> Ivy, Ivy League ish class. And, uh, uh, but, and then you have people like, you know, uh, David Lee Roth, right? Or, or uh, MC Hammer, where, you know, they make millions of dollars and now they're broke. Or as uh, Mick Jagger will never be broken. When he's on a set and you were shooting something and they're on the video, you know, she's like, he, he, all he wanted to talk about was Wall Street Journal and what investments and how stock prices were changing and which currencies you should short. I mean, he's a smart dude, man. So what do you think about like film directors business-wise versus game directors? <laughs> film directors are more like rock stars. And uh, it's more like, hey, I'm, I'm the and the And uh, the smart ones, let's say smart business film directors, uh, I'm not a fan of his films. We went to school at the same time, same place, but uh, it's Michael Bay, right? Michael Bay is a very smart businessman when it comes to film directing, I'll t and I'll tell you why. It doesn't mean he makes films I want to watch, but he knows exactly what his audience is. He'll go, so shoot me. I make films for 14, 15-year-old boys. Kill me. I've right? got a job, he, yeah. And he knows exactly. That's who's buying movie tickets mostly. He's making date movies for boys. And, uh, <laughs> and he cleans up. He knows exactly what he's doing. And he can go make that argument. And he can continue to get more money because it makes sense. And, you know, an old guy who was a brilliant uh, filmmaker was, I, I should say businessman, was Roger Corman. 
right? And if you're familiar with the Roger Corman films, he figured out that for ten dollars I can make a hundred. Yeah. And so he just stuck to a model, and he was very. Another guy in a different way is um, is. And I just got to notice I got more time if you do. Yeah, uh, for sure. Another guy in a different way is Martin Scorsese. Now, Martin Scorsese, they would say, was always jealous of the success of Steven Spielberg. And Steven Spielberg was always jealous of the film auteur recognition that Martin Scorsese got. However, Scorsese was smart enough that he realized he wasn't making blockbuster hits and he never would. What he was doing was he was making all movies for a certain audience and he could depend on that scale of an audience to come see his movies. And the studios were constantly trying to get him because these studios are... are, are uh, so out of touch, and, and this is this, I say with confidence, so out of touch with that, that they measure the success of a movie is largely going to de be dependent on the budget of the movie. So they're always trying to encourage uh, Scorsese to make a more expensive movie. And he's going, I don't want to make a more expensive movie because if I make a more expensive movie, I'm going to lose. Meaning it's not going to be profitable. Yeah. And I know that only this many people like my movies. I have no illusions. I'm not Steven Spielberg. I'm not Michael Bay. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get that many people to see my movie. Now, I might get an Academy Award. That's different, right? I, I'll be expected. The critics might love it. But I'm not going to have a blockbuster summer hit, right? Mm -hmm. So don't try and make me spend more than this much money on the movie. Do you ever, see that, 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 in the, do you ever see that in the game industry? People trying to up the budget just because it'll be easier to sell? Uh... No, no. We're too thrifty. Yeah, I think the games are too easy to escalate into into just a you know we've failed zone. So you talked about like you know the smart businessmen in music and, and film. Who are the smartest businessmen in games? Like who are you looking up to? Well, uh, you know, I mean, I think that a lot of the cases are, are pretty obvious. You know, it's Jason Rubin with Naughty Dog and uh, Andy Gavin and what they pulled off. There's uh, uh, Ray and. Uh, you know, Bioware, Bioware. yeah, uh, Greg, right, Greg, mm -hmm. Greg, were really, I mean, those guys were doc medical doctors, and they figured out they wanted to make games, and then they figured out how to become really stinking rich, so good for them, and they did it doing, qual both companies did it making quality product, so and now Jason you know, gets the double payday of Oculus now, maybe, maybe, right, like, that's got to pay off still, right, um, and, you know, if you were there at Oculus before Facebook bought I'm sure, you know, you're as lucky as lucky, right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if you came in afterwards, I think, you know, now, now you got to have the success that makes back that purchase price where you can really profit. I'm sure, I don't know the ins and outs of these guys' deals, but I'm sure if Jason was interested enough to go take a job, uh, and <laughs> that dude does not need to take a job, right? But if he's interested enough to take a job, you can bet there's, uh, there's he has really good business advisors and his father's a great attorney. And so uh, when I, 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 I will always pay attention to moves that Jason Rubin makes. Interesting. Okay. I mean, it's interesting to think of like Hollywood, going back to your previous point about like Call of Duty announcing like, I hey, want to make Call of Duty cinematic universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think about that in terms of the Oddworld games where I feel like you guys were really ahead of the curve in seeing the potential of having a shared universe in media. Do you want to talk about does it feel like the rest of the world is catching up to you guys in the odd world? Well, uh, uh, I, I don't, it's hard for me to look at it that way, to give you an honest answer. But I look at it this way. We got into games because we saw the opportunity that we could bring deeper character development, uh, better, better cinematics capabilities, manage large teams more efficiently because we've had that experience in the past on films, managing several hundred person teams. Um, and uh, uh, so when I look at sorry, I'm skipping on your question a second. Um, I was talking about the shared universe, having that as so a So the so the shared yeah. So the idea is is that it, it's basically a transmedia idea, right? That that you build a property, it's rich enough that it can transcend different media types. And so we go, Dr. Seuss did it, the Peanuts did it, Disney did it, you know, like some things that started as storybooks became huge. Look at uh uh, Harry Potter, right? Yeah. And uh, so at the time when we started games, games, publishers didn't value sequels. 
And I've said, I've said this uh, more and more recently, but it's hard to get your head around to say publishers did not believe in sequels. And this was one of the aha moments that I had for the game industry. It was I was like, my God, the future is all going to be about brand. And they don't get the value of brand. They were still thinking about it in the early 90s like the toy industry was thinking – which is, well, you have a hit and then, uh, you know, you milk it for all it's worth. But when you make the second one, you're only going to at most sell half as many. So there, that, I mean, when I would say, look, we're building a universe and we're going to be saving digital backlots and we're going to have we're going to have the ability to do television shows and movies and all these things off the shared assets. And how it would be just like, ah, it never works out that way. And the game industry was like, there's no money in sequels. Right. No uh, money in sequels. Why man. would they say it. that? I mean, there were plenty of sequels back in the day, right? No, nope. no, nope. go back. Nope. Uh, what, so. what era were you talking about? Early nineties. Yeah, early nineties. So ninety four, when I started talking, really talking to publishers, raising money, uh, and I'd bring up the argument that we were really building a transmedia universe. They go, "There's nothing in sequels. We don't do sequels." And then you had the beginnings of like Doom was so successful. They said, "Well, let's try Doom 2. Mist was so successful. Well, let's try this. And what happened? They weren't as successful. Right. right. So if you go back and you look at, and these are the business guys, so they're just looking at, you know, how, what was the sales numbers? That's the only story they care about. What's the history of the sales numbers? And um, so they don't care about who f***ed up bringing it to market. They don't care about what, where, what warehouse lost, what goods that weren't on the shelf when you were running your TV commercials and wasting all that money. They don't care about all this stuff. They just look back at history and say, where's the numbers? And the numbers for them at that time were saying there's no real money in sequels. And you didn't have Hollywood guys getting in. And it was the beginning of Hollywood guys getting in. They were like, look, it's going to be a, about catalogs and brands because all entertainment is. It's only a question of time. Mm -hmm. It's all about brand familiarity. There's too much clutter out there. Got to cut through the audience. If, if they they like something and you can say Jaws 2, right? That was the beginning of movie sequels. Right. Right? The Godfather 2 was like, Coppola didn't want to make The Godfather 2. He was like, we don't, what are you talking about? The studio was like, you got to make it, man. You got to make it. It's got to be great. We need a hit. You know, people love The Godfather. That whole sequel idea, that didn't really start until Star Wars and Jaws. You know, Spielberg and Lucas changed film into sequel-driven summer blockbuster hits. So how did the sequel work for you with Exodus? I mean, how were the sales compared to Odyssey? Back in the day? Uh, they were half. And the reason was, well, I don't want to get into specifics of it, but the reasons had little to do with us. It had to do with the machine of, of getting to market, uh, you know, getting disc press, getting, uh, making sure that people, they're supposed to be your support groups, marketing, PR, stuff like that. Basically, those elements were fleeing the publisher at the time that we were releasing Exodus. So although we had a a twice installed base, we had a million games in a warehouse uh, lost as our commercials were running. So that's history. You know, it's not easy history to prove because you can't Google it, right? Mm -hmm. But um, that's just what happened. And so at different times, I was bitter about these kinds of things. But the fact is, it's just life in the business, capitalism. You know, you got to suck it up and deal with it if you want to keep on playing. Are you, are you optimistic these days about the game yeah, industry? Yeah, I am. I am. Because here, let's look at what happened. You know, so we're going, those are old baggage stories. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's like, how did Exodus do? Half as much. So it validated the old models that people were still stuck on, except new heroes were emerging. And, and through those the games became a sequel-driven business, right? Like they, they were starting to get it. You get into now Xbox, and PS, uh, PS2, Xbox, PS3, Xbox 360. These generations, all of a sudden, games are starting to get higher fidelity, better script writers, character development, you know, better rendering. All of this brought more Hollywood to games, really. Yeah. Are you and, still... Uh, and so, you know, okay. but the difference, and this is something film directors didn't understand. They go, oh, well, what happened here? What happened there? I'd be like, you don't get it, man. And the film industry didn't understand. I said, you don't get it. Every five or six years in the game industry, all the theaters go away. And now it starts from zero again. Right? You just keep on building on the collective of the theaters that are growing. You just get more theaters across the world that you can play your films in, and it never gets smaller. What now just imagine you flush them all and start over with a new console generation and they're like, what? That sounds crazy. And you're like, welcome to games, man. It's technology. So what do you think you about know? the rumors of the, you know, PlayStation 4K and having a slightly upgradable Xbox? Do you think that's a likely future for the industry? Yes. And this goes to your question on VR, sure. which is, you know, how's it going to be? What's it look like in five years? Well, the thing I'm pretty convinced about is that VR as a headset is going to change at a similar frequency to how fast cell phones change. It is not going to change. The headset 
is going to be upgraded at a rapid rate. But I, I would say most companies making them are going to be selling new, better ones, just like you go from iPhone 6 to iPhone 7 totally. or whatever. They're going to be selling new, better ones about every six months. Mm-hmm. Right? Consoles is typically six years, right? Five to seven years. So now maybe, and I asked uh, Shu Yoshida at Dice. Actually, it was, it was I, I interviewed Shu Yoshida on the stage at Dice uh, in 2015. Yeah, it was a great video. Oh, thanks. And uh, uh, who I have tremendous respect for. And I asked you a question. We didn't get the we didn't have time to ask it on stage, but I asked him this at dinner a few nights before. Um, I said, "Well, what does the PlayStation Five look like?" And he said, "You mean if?" And I was like, "Whoa!" You know, I, I was like, "Are you willing to say that on on the stage?" And he goes, "Yeah, it's an if, right?" And Even I was though like, PS4 is mean? like dominating sales at that point. It was it was it was it was a really interesting thing. He didn't give me a clear answer, but he's but he's hinting at we need to be more agile. We don't none of us know what the future really looks like. So how do we adapt to it faster? To me, that's the way he was sort of thinking about it, which I think is the right way to think about it. And the idea that you're going to release a piece of technology that lasts for seven years into the future is becoming more and more. Uh, I should say, I think is less and less viable, even though the generations of platforms are lasting longer. Mm-hmm. So they, it seems like it's in conflict. But when you look at the generations of cell phones, and I'll give you an example. We're talking to some of the biggest cell phone, smartphone companies. And what do they want? They want us to be releasing our new PS4, Xbox One titles simultaneously on their latest high-capacity phones with almost the same image fidelity. So now what's going to happen is that mobile is just going to get powerful, 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 powerful. If you talk to Japan publishers, Square, they're releasing on mobile first, and then they'll come to console later. Right. Not necessarily out of fidelity, but, but, but because that's where their audience is. For sure. I mean, of like the business so. divisions in Japan, I think it's like, I think it was like four out of the eight divisions within Square are developing mobile games. Like it's gigantic. Yeah. yeah. So Sony's clearly staying in the game business, and actually they'll be the first ones to win. In VR, I have zero doubts about this. And the reason is they've already got the mechanisms to uh, the plastic, the trucks going to the stores. They've already got the shelf space at the stores. They've already got PSN. They've got the, uh, and, and I've played uh, some of the latest VR titles um, just, you know, a month or so ago of Sony's. And they are damn well good enough to sell and to get people buying them, I can guarantee you. So there's less dumb money in the VR console industry. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Gotcha. Well, hey, I feel like we're running out of time. We should probably let you go, Lauren. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, I babbled, so uh, sorry to, if I churned in. No, no, no. I love it. You're, you've been around for so long. I feel like I could keep you here for six hours, man. So maybe that's an upcoming <laughs> podcast. Is just completely so. drain Lauren's mind. <laughs> All right. Cool. But uh, so Oddworld Soulstorm, what's the time frame? When can we look yeah, forward to that? Yeah, so Soulstorm is coming. Uh, and uh, within, you know, our, our schedule is, is uh, our production schedule is trying to hit uh, – and release within two-year window. Cool. And, uh, but I can't get any more specific. That's our intent, but the fact of the matter is it needs to be great. And we don't like being late, but it needs to be great. So I'm, fingers I'm ex- crossed we're going to stay on this one from beginning to end. Uh, we, you know, we hope we're, we're delivering something that's going to be uh, not just what you would expect, but something a little more. I'm excited to see something new from Oddworld. I think it's going to well, really shout out that story, line. Story take will be going there a bit. And then, and then the whole goal of all of this is that we can basically uh, increase the size of our funding capability and then hopefully uh, hit the audience with a co-funding. Like we'll match whatever. I, I'm not exactly sure, but crowdfunding is not out of the future. Not out of the it's, – it's on the table for future possibilities as we – truly go in and blaze 100% fresh new content. So, I think you're looking um, at FIG, stuff like that. Yeah, those, those are all possibilities, you know, FIG, Kickstarter, et cetera. Uh, but, um, you know, we got to get there. We like not having financial partners. We like being able to make dumb decisions and, <laughs> and live with the consequences. Uh, and we like being in control of our own destiny and not getting pressured into things that might not be good for the business. And so all those things are aligning quite well that we should be able to do a pretty good job on, uh, on Soulstorm. 
And from there, we should have the resources to really launch into new content in a, in a major way. New Oddworld content. Yeah. So hopefully, you know, everyone will support us and, and uh, we make people happy and they don't want to crucify us. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, we're excited to see what you do, man. But hey, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Ben. And thanks for having us. And uh, anytime you want to you wanna, uh, uh, continue the endless ramble of dialogue, you let us know. I would love to. But thank you so much for watching or listening to this episode of The Game Former Show. Be sure to tune in next week and we'll have a new episode waiting for you. Bye, okay, everybody. Excellent.